morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning. I want to welcome you to our time of worship together this morning. We're glad that the Lord has brought you here, has led you here to be with us. If this is your first time visiting with us this morning, please take a moment and fill the Connect card out in the seat in front of you. It's a white card in the back of the seat back. That gives us a record of your visit, and if you have questions about the church or things that you'd like to know or if you'd like to connect with me, if you have questions for me, that's a great way to get those to me. So fill one of those out, and then on the way out this morning, on either side of the door, we have offering receptacles, and you can just drop that card in there on your way out. Got a few announcements this morning. Well, first of all, I hope you guys had a, a happy Thanksgiving. I hope it was a good holiday. I hope that you ate just the right amount to not tap over into gluttony, but you stayed right under the gluttony line because gluttony is a sin, right? But we sort of give ourselves a break on Thanksgiving, but yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the choleric level, the gluttony level, right? Yeah. So, no, no. So uh, we're, we're glad that you're here. I hope you guys had a, a good weekend with your families and whoever you spent Thanksgiving with. We've got a few announcements this morning. The first one is that uh, this Christmas we're doing an Advent devotional. We did this last year. It worked out really well. And so we bought a number of books for the congregation. And so anybody who would like one, take one per family. Uh, it's called Joy to the World by John Piper. And each day has a little two-page devotional. Um, we did it as a family devotional. It's a really great way to get your family connected and get our whole church family going around like the central ideas of Christmas. You can find them in the back in the, in the uh, literature rack over here. They're little red books, Joy to the World by John Piper. So each family take one of those if you didn't get one last week. Um, this is the last week that we're going to take uh, nominations for our officers for next year. So on the back over here, if you're a member of the church and you would like to nominate another member of the church for a specific uh, task, we are looking for trustees, deacons, hospitality director, and church librarians. So you can write those up there. Um, 
please ask the person before you write their name up there, because as soon as, as soon as this week, as soon as Sunday's over, Monday, I'm going to start calling these people and asking if they're willing to do that. So if you put a name up there of somebody that's unwilling, well, then that's just an extra phone call. So um, write those up there. This will be the last week, and uh, I'll contact everybody this week. Uh, third thing is, you know, we, we do our Christmas Eve service every year, or we started a few years ago uh, doing that with First Baptist and Isabella. And so this year, again, that's where it's going to be. All the, our church, their church, and possibly one, of the, one other church in the valley coming together for Christmas. And so the kids, they do a Christmas program. They do uh, a live nativity where they read through all the scriptures and act out all the different parts. So if you have any kids that would like to be a part of that, the practices are Wednesday from four to five each week. And you can just show up over there and, uh, and they'll work them in and find a spot for them. Um, I, I've noticed that we've got a bunch of stuff here in the back. People are bringing things back for our Christmas meal baskets. Um, if, you would like, if you would like to participate in that, every Christmas we do meal baskets for needy families around the valley. And so the past couple of weeks we've put an a insert in the bulletin that has all the things that we're looking for. We didn't put that in this week, but in the back over here next to the nomination sheets, there are lists of things. So if you would like to grab one of those, if you have not already got one, and then uh, we bring all the stuff together, we build the meal baskets, put a ham in there, or in some instances we put a turkey in there. This, this year somebody gave us a turkey. So somebody's getting a turkey. Um, I, told, I think I told you guys this a few weeks ago, but I don't remember. One year we took a ham out to a family, and they were a Jewish family, and then we realized, oh, this isn't, they're not going to eat this. And so um, we went down and bought a turkey. So maybe that's, you know, maybe God gave us a turkey for that specific family or somebody this year. So we've got one of those as well. Um, this month, our MOPS group is doing their Christmas gathering, um, and that's going to be on December 13th. So if you are, they, Mom, MOPS has changed its name now. They're no longer MOPS. They're now MOMCO, which is Mom's Community. And the reason they did this is to emphasize that it's not just for mothers of very small people. It's for any mothers that would like to come and participate with this. So, um, so whether or not you have little kids or not, you can come and be a part of that. And that's going to be on the second, that's the second Wednesday of every month. So that is December 13th. And if you would like to come to that and uh, you can get some more information on our church website, um, Amy posts it on Facebook. Amy and Chris are gone for the next couple of weeks, so can't really ask them. I put it in here, you could, but you can ask me and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, December 17th, we're having our year-end meeting, so every year we pass a budget for the coming year, so we're going to do that, and we'll vote on our officer nominations at that point. Um, and then that afternoon, after the meeting is over, uh, Heather and I are opening up our house for the church. We do this, try to do this every year, and we have a Christmas open house. Heather and Michaela spend several days baking cookies and getting stuff all together, and then we just open our house up, and that afternoon, anyone and everyone in the church that wants to can come over. You can hang out for a few minutes, or you can hang out the whole afternoon, 1.30 to 4.30. Uh, we would just like you to come and, and spend some time with us. So that will be that afternoon. And then uh, last two things here are related to special Christmas offerings. Every year we take up what is called the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It's named after Charlotte Lottie Moon, who was a missionary. And uh, essentially what it does is it helps fund our mission efforts as churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. And so what happens is you know, we, we support 3,500 missionaries as a group of churches, and these missionaries are fully supported, so they don't have to come home and, and beg for funds or do anything else like that. And so what, what we do is we give every month, and then at the end of the year, we collect a special mission offering, and that goes to help with those expenses. And so it's a good system. It's always worked out really well. Um, and so if you want to participate in that, you can take one of the offering envelopes and write Lottie Moon or, or missions offering or something on that and drop that in one of the boxes. And then the last thing is related to a special project that we're doing to support one of the missionaries that we, we have interacted with. This last year, we took a trip to Camp of the Woods in Ontario, and when we were there, we, we noticed that they need, had a need, and their need was for, um, for a new sound system. So we're trying to raise the funds for that sound system. Um, in a couple weeks here, we're going to do some we're going to do some Christmas wrapping if you'd like to, to do that for a donation. And we're also going to offer the opportunity for people to go and Christmas shop without their kids. We'll watch their kids. And so that's another opportunity for us to try to raise some funds for that as well. So, um, But if you just want to give to that, if, if the Lord puts it on your heart that, hey, I'd like to participate in, in providing for that, you can also write on an envelope, um, Project Amplify, 
and then we'll get that. And then when we have it, we're going, this is from now until Easter, so you'll hear about this uh, over the course of the next few months. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it all together so that in the spring we can send Jason up there to put together a whole new sound system for them in time for camp that summer, which uh, it will be a real blessing to them. So those are the announcements. Those are the things that we've got going on. Uh, I want to invite you to stand and just take a moment to greet those who are around you here this morning. Now there is no condemnation, now there is no guilt or shame, for those who have been covered by the blood of Jesus. Now the words of our accuser have been robbed of all their power, and the enemy has been defeated by the blood of Jesus. So we stand with our hearts washed clean, and we lift up our hands and sing, we are more than conquerors, we are more than conquerors, God if you are for us, who can be against us, we are more than conquerors. today we're thankful that because of what Christ has done we are more than conquerors as it says in Romans we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and we thank you that you've loved us enough to give yourself for us Jesus and we pray that as uh, we come to this time of learning from your word that uh, we would have our love for you deepened and our understanding of what uh, you desire for us expanded I pray that you would help us to 
to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Pastor Ben comes to share the word. Give us ears to hear what you would say to us. Bless him by your spirit as he comes to share. And we just ask for the rest of the service to be blessed by you. And we pray that you would uh, be here with us as you promised to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. If you have a Bible with you this morning, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 7. If you do not have a Bible, you can find one in one of the seats in front of you. Matthew chapter 7. It's the first book of the New Testament, seventh chapter of that book. Now, most of you that know Heather and I, uh, at least fairly well, know that we have a dog. Now, our dog is a little shaky rat dog named Oscar. And uh, Oscar is afraid of everything. Um, he, he, is, uh, he is hypoallergenic, so we had to have, because I have pet allergies, we had to have something that doesn't set those off. Now, aside from being hypoallergenic, Oscar is otherwise fairly worthless as a dog goes. <laughs> he does not play. He is not fun. He is stiff as a board, and if you pick him up, his little legs straighten out. When you pet him, he's not fun to pet. It's like petting a flexed arm because there's no fat on this little dog, but we discovered a little while back that Oscar could do something for us. He could contribute to our family. Now, Oscar's not much of a barking dog. The only time he ever barks is if somebody gets on our front porch or they get on our deck. If somebody that we do not know is there gets on there, that dog will go absolutely crazy. And we found that to be very useful in letting us know that people were there that we did not know were there. And back in December of 2021, it was the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, Heather and I are sound asleep, dreaming, and then that dog just goes nuts and starts barking. So we automatically assume that there's somebody on our porch, there's somebody trying to get into our house. So we get up and I grab something with which to defend ourselves, and the two of us go to the living room expecting to find somebody trying to get in one of the doors, but what we actually found was a bear on our front porch and... This bear was pushing on the door of the house. My assumption here is that bear is trying to get into our house. But what I failed to realize is that somebody in their kindness and generosity had given us a high quality Boy Scout wreath that had berries on it and the bear was going after the berries. So here he is hitting this door with his big bear paws and I'm on the other side wondering like, what on earth am I going to do if that door comes open and that bear comes in? I don't know what I would have done, but here's the, here's the thing. We very much appreciated Oscar barking to let us know about something that we didn't know was there. Now this week, as I was reading in Matthew chapter 7, and I got to the section of text, verses 15 through 20, that we're going to be looking at this morning, I started thinking about Oscar as an illustration of the need for people in churches to be alert, to be alerted to the fact that there are ungodly influences that work their way into churches. There are false teachers that work their way into churches, and we need somebody who can spot these things that we don't even know are there and raise the alarm so that we are not led astray through false teaching and evil ideologies. This morning, we're in the closing sections of the Sermon on the Mount, and as I had said last week, it begins and ends with, with a choice to make, and in between are these cautions. So last week, we talked about the choice of walking the king's path or the world's way, and this week, we're talking about developing discernment about who it is that we listen to and who it is that we follow. What we need to realize is that Jesus knew when he came and started ministering that his time on earth was short. His earthly ministry, though Jesus was on earth for 33 years, his earthly ministry was only three years as public ministry. That's less time than you're in high school, right? It's only three years. And so he had some specific tasks that needed to be accomplished during this three-year period of time. And the most important, the first of those was securing salvation. At Christmas time, we celebrate Jesus coming, God in the flesh who came to this earth, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and died an atoning death in order to secure our salvation. That's priority number one. But the second priority of Christ was ensuring that this message of what he did got its way out to people. And this is where the recruiting work of Jesus came in. Jesus came, and it was always his intent 
to do the heavy lifting and to make the way for man to be reconciled to God, but then to pass that work on to human beings. And so those that he recruited, they'd be equipped and empowered and instructed and directed by the supernatural oversight of the Holy Spirit to go out and to share the gospel and to call people to become citizens of the kingdom. And that's what our work is, right? As followers of Jesus, as the people who are citizens of his kingdom that are following after his way, we're called to go make disciples of all nations. We're called to share the gospel. And this task has always been a task that has a divine element and a human element. And what's problematic about that is the human element, right? Because human beings are messy. And there was always a chance that along with people that would take this responsibility and and do it with with grace and with obedience, there was always going to be people who had selfish motives. And there were going to be people who who had things that they were trying to gain for themselves. And they were going to be mixed in with the people who were trying to accomplish the task that God gave them in obedience. There were going to be opportunistic, selfish people that saw this task as a way to get things and to gain power. And so as Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount, as he comes into these last few sections here, he has to warn his disciples about the ever-present danger of false prophets and false teachers. And this morning, I'm going to use those interchangeably because what we're talking about is we're talking about people who claim to be from Christ people who claim to have a word from God, people who claim some authority from him, but who do not actually have that. And through the passage that we're going through this morning, we're going to hopefully develop the discernment to be able to spot the people who are doing this. So Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15, follow along with me. This is what it says. It says, "'Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves.'" You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. And in this passage, Jesus employs two complementary metaphors, the metaphor of the, of the, the wolves and the sheep, and then the metaphor of the, the trees and the fruit. And through these two metaphors, he's going to teach us about developing discernment. Our outline this morning is going to be fairly simple. It's just two points. We're going to, first of all, explore the present danger that's there, that was not just there in Christ's time. It was there when he, after he ascended, and it remains there now for those of us who are 21st century believers. And then we're going to dive into his solution, the way that we can spot these people. So the first thing we want to do, if you're taking notes this morning, is look at the ever-present danger of ravenous predators. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And when we talk about like nature and the circle of life, there are essentially two kinds of animals out here. I know that it's a bit more complicated than this, but there's, there's predatory animals and there's prey animals. You know, some people will say, well, some animals are both, and that's true depending on the circumstance, but for our purposes, let's maintain the binary here. There are some simple ways to distinguish between predatory and prey animals. Now, this doesn't apply in every case, but for the most part, it is true. Predators oftentimes have what? Front-facing eyes. While prey animals have their eyes where? On the side of their heads. The front eyes so they can hunt, the side eyes so they can see the thing that's trying to hunt them. Very often, your predatory animals will have sharp teeth and they'll have fangs, whereas your prey animals will have flat teeth because they're out chewing grass and doing things like that. A lot of times, your predatory animals will have claws or they'll have talons with which they can grasp things. And your prey animals will oftentimes have hooves and they'll have the muscle structure to run quickly to get away from these animals that have the claws and the fangs and the forward-facing eyes. Now, if you look at these sets of animals here, here's the first set. It's, it's pretty easy to tell which one's predator and which one's prey, right? Unlike Disney movies will have you believe, these two are not friends that are out having a chase around the meadow and enjoying time together. The one on the left wants to kill the one on the right. And, and you see the, the fangs, and you see the forward-facing eyes on this animal. Take the next picture right here. This is predator and prey, right? 
The one on the left is predator. The one on the right is prey. One of the things that just blew my mind a number of years ago was that down in the Andes Mountains, they have these eagles. They look like golden eagles. They may or may not be. But these, these eagles would fly up to the ledge and they would grab a goat that's on the ledge and they would just yank it off. And then the goat would just pinwheel you know, 2,000 feet down to the bottom and then they would go collect them and they would eat them there on the ground. Now, when you look at these two pictures, it's pretty easy to spot the predator and the prey, right? Like, it's, it's not difficult for us. We can see the teeth, we can see the claws, we can see the eyes. But when we start talking about spiritual predators and spiritual prey, it gets a little murkier and it gets a little more difficult. In Ephesians 6, Jesus told us that we are in a battle. He told us we are in a war. He told us that there is an enemy that we are to be aware about. And this enemy, God's enemy, is out there trying to undo the things that God is doing. But it's not always easy to spot. It's not always easy to see who is on which side. And so we, as God's people, have to be aware of the fact that we might be the intended prey of some spiritual predator looking to take advantage of God's people and destroy God's things. And this is why Jesus begins with the word, beware. Be aware of the fact that there are dangers, namely ravenous wolves that will work their way into the flock for nefarious purposes. Now, two things that we need to examine in relationship to this, 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 these predatory wolves, these ravenous wolves, is first of all, their destructive nature. We have to consider their destructive nature. In English, we, we use this word ravenous, and what that encompasses is both the idea of, of something being ferocious, but also incredibly hungry. So that, that's ravenous. It's, it's a ferocity, but it's also this deep hunger. In Greek, the word that's used here is the word harpax, and what it means is greedy. And the, the verbal form of this, harpazo, means to grasp at or to reach out for. And so the, the, the picture you get from this is something that is, is desirous, it's hungry, and it's grabbing, and it's reaching, and it's trying to pull something in. That's the, the, the picture that we get, and it's describing these wolves that will tear you apart in order to satisfy their hunger or improve their standing. One commentator wrote this, he says, their focus is on their own belly and satiating their own hunger. So whatever it is that they have to do to take care of their needs and their wants and their desires, whatever they have to do to get whatever it is that they're going after, they're going to do that. And they're going to destroy in the process. They will destroy to enrich themselves. In the first century, there were a lot of false teachers that were weaving their way through the churches because the churches were newly planted and they didn't necessarily have the strongest of leadership in them. And so false teachers would work their way in. This is why the apostle Paul was writing a lot of his letters, why Peter was writing to the, to the people who were dispersed is because of these false teachers. And close to the end of the first century, around 100 AD, there was a document that was written and was put out called the Didache. And the Didache, which means the teaching, was, was a document that was supposed to help churches to understand certain things that Jesus had taught them and also to understand certain practical things. And one of the things that the Didache does is it lays out how to know if somebody is a false teacher or not. And, and through a series of different statements, it all bears down to this. The simplest test is to ask, are they trying to enrich themselves or are they trying to benefit you? That's the question that you ask. Are they serving you? Are they serving the Lord or are they trying to enrich themselves? If it's the latter, then what's going to happen is they are going to harm you on the path to their own benefit. Peter warns about this in the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. He says, in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. They'll exploit you. They will take advantage of you because they're trying to get something for themselves. But it's not just monetary gain, and it's not just the things that they can gather around themselves. The apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 30, describes false teachers in a similar way that Jesus does. He says this, this he's talking to the Ephesian elders, he's getting ready to leave, and he's sort of giving them sort of his last instructions, and this is what he says that after I leave, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. And then he gives the motive to draw away the disciples after them. 
They're speaking these falsehoods. They're telling people things that aren't true, all because they're trying to develop their own following. They're trying to get their own group. They're trying to get people to follow after their way. False teachers are destructive. And if you consider where they come from, it makes perfect sense. Because what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, is he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Same idea as beware here. Like, keep your focus. Watch what's going on. Pay attention. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Okay, it's the same idea. It's the same warning because it's all coming from the same place. God's people will be collateral damage for these people that are following after the devil's ways. And sometimes, a lot of times, they don't even know that that's what they're following after. They're just going after what's good for them. They're just thinking about what's best for them and what's best for their brand and what's best for their family and what's best for their life. And they will destroy in the process. And they're okay with that. And this is, as an aside, one of the ways that you can spot false teachers They have a selfish focus, and they don't seem to care what happens to people along the way. They'll leave carnage. They'll leave hurt people in their wake. They will crawl across the dead bodies of all the people that they've left if it helps them to reach their goal. They don't care about people. They use people for their own benefit. They are ravenous wolves and they will destroy things in order to get what they want. So Jesus says, watch out, beware of these people, beware, because they're ravenous. They have a destructive nature. But he also has to tell them to be sober-minded, be watchful, beware of this because of their deceptive nature. Today, we're, we're pretty cognizant about certain threats to the church. You know, in recent years, you've seen more and more churches where people have come in and they've shot up churches. I mean, you're seeing it everywhere. It's happening in schools, but it's happening in churches as well. Last year, there was a church, a Taiwanese church in California where somebody went in and they shot up the church and they ended up killing one and and wounding five other people. You guys remember in 2017, the church shooting in Texas, and then we have the church shooting in Charlottesville. That's an overt danger. It's easy to spot. And then in Canada, between 2021 and 2023, over the last two years, 83 different churches have been burned down. An arsonist has been going through and burning churches down. These are overt threats. These things make national news. These things, they make international news. But false teachers, they're far more subtle. It's far less overt. You know, the church shooter, he comes and he overtly takes life. The false teacher, he works his way in and he poisons the water before anybody even knows what is going on or who he is or she because they're disguised. And while they're actually wolves who want nothing more than to fill their bellies and want nothing more than to benefit themselves, what they're going to look like to you is they're going to look like sheep. That's the whole goal. That's what they're trying to do is they're disguising themselves so that they will look like one of you. They will disguise themselves so that they look like a part of the flock. Meaning that we can expect that much of what they say and much of what they do will seem harmless or perhaps even beneficial. You know, the wolves, they're not coming in looking like classic villains. There was a years and years and years ago, there was an episode of The Simpsons. And in this episode of The Simpsons, the preacher in the church said, the devil is sitting among you. And Bart looks to his right and there's a guy there wearing a red suit with a goatee. He goes, I got him. And he jumps on him and grabs him. That's not what he's talking about. Like they're not going to come looking overtly like a villain. They're going to come in with a family and they're going to come in with a smile and a handshake. And they're going to come in and they're going to look Like everything is good and everything is right. And before I go any further into the deceptive nature, this is not an opportunity to start looking left and looking right and going, I bet it's that guy. I bet it's her. I bet this is who it is. That's not the point of what I'm trying to do this morning. They're not going to come in looking like they are evil or destructive. They're going to come in looking good, but the motives and the machinations behind the scenes are not going to have that same goodness. So think of the person who comes into a church and they work to grab a position of influence within the church. 
And you don't notice it at first, right? You just think they're being helpful, but then eventually you start to notice, well, they're trying to get in a position of influence. And then once they have that position of influence, they begin to undermine the leadership of the church. Think of the the person who comes in and begins to make friends, and then once they make friends, they begin to start sowing division through their gossip and through their slander and through the things that they do. The Apostle Paul in Romans 16, 17, and in Titus 3, 10, and 11 warns of this. Check out the scripture here on the screen. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once or twice, have nothing to do, knowing that such a person is what? Warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So the person that comes in and begins to make and build relationships, and then begins to use those relationships to divide people and to break the church apart. That's what we're looking for. Number three, think of a teacher who comes in knowing precisely the doctrinal stance that the church takes, but then begins to introduce spurious ideas, quietly undermining the doctrine and sowing confusion among God's people. Peter talks about this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. False prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false prophets among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Paul in 2 Peter, or Peter, sorry, There are some some things in Paul's writings that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. There's going to be people that come in and they're going to teach and they know full well what it is the church believes. They know full well what it is that's true, but they're going to introduce these other ideas here. Think of the person who isolates and takes the spiritually immature under their wing and begins to feed them falsehoods. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 16, verse 18. If we can get 16, 18 up here. There we go. Such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. There are going to be people who they're going to see the opportunity to take young believers that don't know a lot about God's word, and they're going to take them aside, and they're going to start to feed them things that aren't true. And instead of, instead of establishing them firmly in the truth, as 2 Peter 1.12 talks about, or getting them to the point where they're stable, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 4.13 and 14, they're going to make little copies of themselves that are buying into things that aren't true. Or think about the person who gathers a group together to do a book study about some intriguing new idea or some, some new take on Christ that actually turns out to be some heresy that the church rejected 1,500 years ago but keeps popping up and working its way into things. I mean, that's happening all the time. Like, you know, there are these Christian books that come out and everybody gathers around them and they're all reading them and they're all interested in what's going on. Like, oh, have you read this new book, The Universal Christ by Richard Rohr? This is a great take on Jesus. It's not, it's heretical, right? There's a lot of stuff out there that is just a rehashing of of heresies that the church 1,500 years ago said, no, this is not true. This is not according to scripture, but that's going to happen, right? People are going to work these things in. Paul dealt with this in Colossians chapter 2, and the writer of Hebrews dealt with this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, with these, these things that could possibly be true. The writer of Hebrews, don't be led away by what? Diverse and strange teachings. All of this stuff has popped up in the history of the church. All of this stuff continues to be here. And these deceptive people that are trying to establish their position and establish their following, these ravenous wolves are the ones who will come in and introduce these ideas. And Jesus, he gives us this, this warning because we need to be aware of the fact that this is happening. And you might instinctively think, well, if I'm in a good Bible teaching church, I'm safe, right? Here's the scary truth. The wolves are already in the flock. The wolves in sheep's clothing are already milling around among the faithful. And proximity alone will not protect you. Yes, it will help you out and and keep you from being picked off like those who are wandering around in the churchless Christianity wasteland. But it's not a guarantee that just being around good teaching is going to protect you from being drawn away into false teaching. You know, the reality that every single pastor lives with 
is that there are almost always going to be people in just about every church who are working their way in for destructive purposes. People who do not serve the interests of the Lord, but as Romans 16, 18 tells us, serve their own appetites that are trying to benefit themselves and in the process of doing so, work against God and His people. You know, I've been in ministry now since 2002. That's when I graduated and went into full-time ministry. Prior to that, about five years, I was volunteering in the church. And in all of those years, I have spotted wolves. I've seen them. I've seen what they do. And I've suspected wolves because I see the ripples of what happens in relationships and what people are doing. And there have been times that I have flat out missed them and was bit by them on the far side of it because I wasn't paying enough attention. And I'm convinced more often than not that these wolves are, are themselves deceived people. People who think they're doing good. I talked about this in a previous sermon, but I mentioned that the, the, the nature of a good villain is a good villain doesn't know they're a villain. They, they actually think they're doing the right thing. You know, I, talked about, I talked about Adolf Hitler, kind of like history's big villain. Adolf Hitler thought he was doing the right thing for the Jewish people, or for the, not the Jewish people. He, he thought he was doing the right thing for the German people by getting rid of the Jewish people and by getting rid of the crippled people and by getting rid of the gypsies. He thought he was purging. He thought he was doing the right thing, but ultimately what he was doing was destructive and what he was doing was evil. And I'm convinced that many of those who Jesus is talking about here, the false teachers, are the same people that are mentioned in the next passage. If you jump ahead in verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And he says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I think... Many of the people that are there are people who were in churches who thought they were doing right, who thought they were doing the good thing, but really, ultimately, all they were doing was serving themselves. That is the nature of self-deception, right? You think you're doing the right thing, but you're not checking your motives and you're not checking your actions against some standard and saying, is this objectively good or bad what I'm doing? No, no, we just let ourselves be the standard and we think we're the ones who get to set what's right and wrong and good and bad. And then we find ourselves doing things that are objectively destructive. And I'm convinced that a good number of the people that he's talking about here are those very same ones who are going to look and go, I thought that what I was doing was the right thing. Now granted, there's going to be people in there who know they're doing the wrong thing and who are just destroying because that's in their nature. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus makes it clear. Like, even within the context of the church, even among the faithful, you're going to find people whose motivations and their directions are not aligned with what it is that God is calling us to do. The previous passage, he says, there's a narrow way, there's a wide way. He's already established, like there's, it's a binary, right? You can either be going on this path or you can be going on this path over here. And his path is narrow and it's more difficult and you're going to find those people who are coming into that path, not to walk the path, but to pull people off the path. In the pastoral and agrarian world, it's shepherds who are tasked with running off and shooting predators that would harm the flock. And in the church world, it's the job of under-shepherds, of pastors and elders to, who are tasked with correcting sheep that get off the mark and in the process start pulling people away and running off the predators and the wolves who come in and begin to destroy. That's what the, that's what the Apostle Paul was telling the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. When I leave, fierce wolves are going to come in. You've got to be aware. You've got to be watching for them because they're going to come in and they're going to start destroying things. So that's your job to watch for them. But the fact of the matter is, is that as the solo pastor of a church, like, hey, I can't do that on my own. I can't be the only person who is looking. And the fact of the matter is, is that this passage is not written to just pastors. Jesus is preaching this. He's, he's speaking this to all of his followers. Because the reality is that each and every one of us, each and every single person who's a follower of Jesus has the responsibility to be aware, to be looking around, to be checking and making sure that things are as they should be. <clears throat> we need Oscars, right? 
We need people within the church who, when something is where it shouldn't be, are going to raise the alarm and say, this is not supposed to be here. That's what we need. And so Jesus, then he gives us a test. He gives us a means of spotting the wolves that are in our midst. And that's the second observation, the discernment test, learning to spot falsity. Now, the way that you spot falsity, if you have, as you follow along with me here, is that you examine the fruit of their lives and their ministries. If you want to know if someone is genuine, look at their lifestyle, look at their character, look at their family life, look at the results of their ministry, look at what is going on around them. Don't just look at them because they're putting on a mask. They're making sure everything looks good, but you're going to see the ripples. You're going to see the things that are in the wrong place. See if they grow, see if they encourage, see if they build, see if their focus is the glory of God, see if the people who come around them are growing or if they are stagnating. See if they isolate and divide, see if they create paranoia and cliquishness, see if they destroy. This applies to any single person who would stand up in a church and would speak or teach or preach, and anybody that would bring in and would lead a study, this applies even to me. Everybody here should be looking at me. And it's not, hey, look at me, everybody, look at me. No, everyone here should be asking the questions of me. Does he do what he says? Is he following the word? Is his life exemplifying what the scriptures teach? Does his behavior, conduct, reflect the expectations of Christ? And are the people who are learning and being discipled by him growing in their faith and conforming to the way of Christ? Those are the questions we should be asking of anybody who would teach, anybody who would begin to call people to follow after Christ. Is it evident in their lives that they actually believe these things or are they simply saying things to draw people after themselves? Jesus gives us the fruit test to protect us from being led astray. And so first we see the revelatory power of fruit. In verse 16 and 20, twice we see the same phrase. He says, you will know them by their fruit. Okay, this, this forms grammatically what's called an inclusio. And an inclusio is a set of brackets. So the main point is the brackets, and then there's explanatory material in between. And the main point in verses 16 and verses 20 is that fruit reveals... When we see fruit, we know what kind of a tree something is. So like if I want to know what a tree is and there's fruit on it, I can go examine the fruit. If I walk up to the tree and there are apples on it, I'm like, I wonder if this is an orange tree. No, I know if there are apples, it's an apple tree. Like we know this. I got the fruit here, right? This thing on the bottom here, those are cherries. The thing on the left down there, those are grapes. That's a grapevine. It's an orange tree. It's a lemon tree. It's a pomegranate. It's an apple. I can look at the fruit and I can know what the tree is. And I can also know if it's healthy. When talking about spiritual leaders, prophets in this case, teachers in this case, the fruit of their ministry is indicative of the kind of ministry they have and the kind of life that they live. And here, fruit can be character. It can be the results of their ministry. It could be the things that come out of them, the words that come out of their mouth. When Luke deals with the same concept here and when Matthew deals with this later in Matthew chapter 12, in both cases, one of the things that you see as the fruit is the words that come out of their mouth, how they talk, the things that they say. But beyond that, it's character and results. We ask, what kind of fruit grows on a true prophet and a true teacher? Well, Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23 is very helpful for us because it, it enumerates the fruit of the Spirit, that which grows when the Spirit is present and active, that which is tangible and observable when the Holy Spirit is at work within somebody. And we, we know the list, right? There's nine things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, and gentleness. Okay? Paul lays these things out. This is what grows on somebody if the Holy Spirit is at work within them. And if these things are present and increasing, then I can deduce that this person probably has a genuine connection to the Holy Spirit, and that's where the growth is coming from. And, and, if, and if the people, the the people that are listening to them and are following after them are also manifesting that fruit, then we can conclude that this might be a God thing. 
If there's somebody and they've gathered a group of people around them and they've been teaching these people and leading these people over the course of days and months and years and none of those people are beginning to manifest spiritual fruit, there is good reason to look and say, hey, this might be false teaching. This might be a false teacher. These might be people who don't genuinely know the Lord. These are the things that we're told to look for. If a person manifests none of these and the people who are learning from their ministry and following aren't producing, you might be dealing with a false teacher. The fruit shows what the tree is. In context, in this passage, there's also another identifying mark. Jesus identifies that what grows in a genuine connection with God is obedience to the will of the Father. If you look down at verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. A life that is conforming to the revealed will of God. The person who's looking and you see that they're pursuing Christ's likeness in their lifestyle. That's fruit. False teachers don't submit to the will of God and they don't point you in that direction either. Now they, they may burden you down with a bunch of expectations. They may take the Bible and they may pull stuff out of context and they may dump a whole bunch of rules on you and they may create some sort of religious looking system that you're working in. But the end result of it isn't that you are in a closer walk with Christ or obedience to Him, it's that you're enslaved to more rules and more standards. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul was dealing with in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, he is talking to people that have come in and they've said, you're not doing enough. You also need to add circumcision. You also need to add the, the law in here. You've got to follow it in the same way that the Jewish people have always followed it. Well, guess what? That's a, that's a false teaching. And so on one side, they may enslave and they may add all of these things, contorting the scripture, adding to the scripture, but in the opposite direction, they might be somebody who's coming in and telling you, hey, just do whatever you want, live how you want, live like the world, act how you want, grace, 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 and they'll throw grace everywhere and they'll, and they'll tell you that whatever you want to do is fine and however you want to live is fine, however you want to act is fine, whatever you say is fine, whatever you entertain yourself with is fine, whatever you do is fine, everything is fine because there's grace to cover these things up. The problem with that is that in the previous passage, what did Jesus just say? The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and there are few who find it. Christ has expectations for us. He is driving us to pursue holiness in our lifestyle. And if there's a teacher out there who's riding on the bulldozer trying to take the narrow path and make it wider and cutting off the commands of Christ and saying, this doesn't apply to you and this doesn't apply to us and this isn't for us and this isn't, that's probably a false teacher that you're dealing with. You might have it on the one end, piling on all kinds of rules. You might have it on the other end, telling you just go and do whatever you want and live however you want and everything is fine. Both of those are false teachers. And the, the fruit of that ministry, how their life, and how their character, how that begins to show itself and that of the people that are following, that's what you've got to be looking for. There is, there is a revelatory power of fruit. The, tree, the fruit reveals the type of tree and the health of the fruit can reveal the spiritual health or lack of health of the prophet or the teacher. So then we look finally at this, the obvious nature of health. I've got, a, I've got a tree in my front yard. I've actually got two fruitless mulberry trees in my front yard. And a few years ago on one of those trees, we began to notice a lot of dead branches. And we began to notice that a lot of branches weren't producing leaves. And so we began to sort of start working and cutting those off because we're like, ah, this might, there might be some kind of a problem in this tree, so let's cut those branches off and let's hope it gets better. And over the course of a few years, we'd cut a branch, we'd cut a limb, and then this summer we go out there and we walk around the backside of the tree and there are giant pieces of bark that are just falling off the tree. Now listen, neither Heather and I are botanists or arborists, but we could both look at that and say, that's not good. Like that's not supposed to be like that. Why? Because there are, there are obvious signs of health. Happy green leaves, the kind that Bob Ross would be painting on there, that's good, right? That's what you want on a tree. 
Dead branches and tree leprosy where the skin is falling off, that's not what you want. That's bad. And you don't have to be a professional and you don't have to be an expert to look at that and go, green leaves, healthy tree, things falling apart out of the tree, unhealthy tree. It's, it's obvious, is it not? Healthy trees don't produce bad fruit. Unhealthy trees don't produce good fruit. This is what Jesus says. If all the ingredients and all the nutrients are there and all the proper growth and development processes are working as they should, what it will yield is it will yield good fruit. And what Jesus is saying here is that these wolves, they might hide, they might sneak in, they might slap on a smile, they might act really good, but their real nature is going to be obvious to the one who is examining the fruit. You can tell if one is a trustworthy leader by the goodness or badness of the fruit. And listen, it can be quite obvious. If you've done the work ahead of time to know what spiritual health looks like, it becomes more obvious. You don't need a seminary education. You don't need a theological degree. All you need to know is what health looks like. And here's the good news. You can open this book each and every day. You can open it every morning or every evening, and you can take and examine it, and you can read it, and you can study it for yourself. You don't need me. Like You can do all this on your own, and in that process, you can learn what spiritual health looks like so that when you see that which is unhealthy, you recognize it. This is, this is just like learning to spot counterfeit bills. You know, when, you're trying, when you're learning to spot counterfeit bills, you don't study all the counterfeits. What do you study? The original, right? You look at it, you examine it, you figure out what is it supposed to be doing? How are these things supposed to be together? What size is this supposed to be? Like, how is this supposed to look? What does the background look like? You study it and you examine that. And in the process, then once, once you've learned that and once you're starting to understand that, how it feels, how it looks, all the design elements, then when somebody tries to pass off a counterfeit, it just reveals itself. When God's people are serious about getting to know him through his word and they are equipped and they are educated and they are engaged in his word, the less places the wolves have to hide. If God's people come to know his word, if God's people take serious the challenge to to learn what is true and what is right and what is spiritually healthy and unhealthy, the wolves will have less places to hide. Wolves flourish and they run rampant and they feast when God's people are biblically illiterate and biblically ignorant. That's when they have their best chance to deceive is when God's people don't even know his word. That's that's when they flourish. And so we need to get in the word. We need to learn what healthy fruit looks like so that when unhealthy fruit is presented to us, we actually recognize it. This last week or two weeks ago, Heather bought a a bag of pears. And these pears look great, right? They had a nice yellow color to them and they were all perfectly shaped and they looked really good and they sat there on our counter for a couple days. And then last week, Heather went to go get one of these pears and she pulled it out and she immediately knew something's not right with this pear because it felt like, you guys remember Stretch Armstrong dolls? That's what it felt like. Anybody that's eaten a pear, you know it's supposed to be firm. You know it's what it's supposed to feel like. And she picked that thing up, and it's just this squishy, like, leathery water balloon feel. How did she know that that was it? She didn't, she didn't open it up. She didn't examine it. She didn't put it under a microscope. No, no. She's had enough good pears to know what a bad pear feels like. And when she picked that thing up, she's like, yeah, these guys are gone. So she took and she threw them away. Because that's what you do with the bad pears. Jesus gives us this test to help us discern and defend, discern the fruit, discern the health, and then act accordingly. That's what this passage is teaching us to do. You've got to learn to look at the fruit. You've got to learn what the real deal looks like so that when the false thing is being presented to you, you immediately know that it's a false thing. You know, aside from the the tiny domestic predators that we keep in our homes, most of us do not play with prowling predators. We don't let them around our kids or our pets. On that night, on December of 21, I didn't unlock the door and let the bear in, right? You've got to keep the bear on the outside. 
Like we don't tolerate their presence. We don't give them the opportunity to do harm. We expose them and then we remove them. That bear that had been out on my driveway previous to that and then was up on my step, he was about one more visit to me calling animal control. Why? Because he's a danger. He can't be there. He can't be that bold. He can't be up on my step. He can't be on my deck, right? Like he can't be there because he presents a danger to our family. Jesus promises us that those who are false teachers in verse 19 are eventually going to be punished, right? If you look at verse 19, it says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown in the fire. This is an allusion to judgment day. But just like the, the, the wheat and the tares, the tares in, in uh, Matthew chapter 13, they're going to be among us until that judgment day comes. And so the task for each and every one of us is that we've got to be alert. We have to be aware. We have, to, we have to be watching. We have to be looking and seeing what is going on beyond just the words that are coming out of their mouth. What's happening? In closing, I want to tie this element together with what we talked about last week. If we remember last week, the choice, there's two ways, there's two gates. And so we we're called to walk on this certain path. Jesus says, take the narrow way. Go through the narrow gate, take the narrow way. And while we're on this path, <clears throat> there's going to be plenty of people who come along and help us to walk this path. But there's also going to be plenty of people that come around that are going to distract us and are going to trip us up on this path. There's going to be people that come along and they're going to help us take the next step and they're going to help us navigate the terrain and there's going to be other people that trip us up and there's going to be other people that pull us off the path and there's going to be other people that tell us, hey, there's a shortcut here that really doesn't lead anywhere. And the task for us is to learn to understand which is which. We need to populate our church with Oscars, with people who know what's supposed to be there and what's not, and who will sound the alarm when these things show up. So from Jesus, check the fruit. Don't just be ready and willing to just pull in and give influence to anyone. This is a mistake that churches make. You'll have people come into the church, and as soon as they arrive in the church, they seem like everything is good in their lives, and then everyone will be like, hey, we have a need to fill. Let's put this person in this position. I have made that exact mistake myself. We have a need here. Let's put this person in it. And then before long, you realize you're dealing with, you're dealing with a predator. What we need is the discernment to know the difference, the patience to watch and examine the life. And then once we've done that, we will protect ourselves from the dangers that Jesus warns us about here. May God give us the wisdom and the discernment to spot the difference. Amen? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you so much for the truth of your word. And Lord, we are grateful for the warning that you give us. We recognize that there are present dangers around us. And Lord, we recognize that there are there, there is deception in this world. And Lord, we realize that, that that deception could even exist here. Lord, that even, even in, in a place that is dedicated to honoring you and glorifying you, that, that the enemy is still at work. And so, Lord, we, in recognizing this truth, we, <clears throat> we put our hope in you and we put our faith in our trust in you, and we recognize that you alone will defend us, and you alone, you alone will give us the wisdom that we need. And so, Lord God, give us the wisdom, give us the discernment, give us the understanding, so that we will follow after you, and we will not get distracted by those who are trying to to drag us away from you. Lord God, thank you so much for the truth of your word. We commit and submit ourselves to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thank you for being here this morning. We're glad that you came to worship with us. And my prayer for each and every one of you this week is that God will begin to grow your discernment and that God will begin to give you wisdom. You know, it tells us in James, if we lack wisdom, we just need to ask, right? If we will ask the Lord for wisdom, he will grant it to us. He will give us what we need to be able to spot the predators and be able to examine the fruit and to know the truth. But part of that's got to be that we go to him and we say, God, you teach me, you show me, teach me your ways, show me your truth so that we're defended against being led astray by false teachers. God, grant us wisdom. We're going to end our service this morning in the way that we end our service each and every week, which is to take our offering um, on the back, on either side of the door, there are offering receptacles. And if the Lord has placed it upon your heart to contribute, whether to the ministries of this church or to Lottie Moon or to uh, Project Amplify, whatever it might be, however the Lord is leading you, place those in there. And if you filled out a, con- a Connect card this week, you can place that in there as well. Pray for you this week. Pray that God would give you wisdom, that God would give you his grace, and that uh, you guys would have a really great week. And hopefully we will see you back on next Sunday. I'll meet you guys at the door.